We're very happy to have you here, and we um, designed it to just have a um, kind of like laid-back conversation uh, regarding your interests in mm -hmm. cross-cultural psychology. Uh, so first, I think we would like to ask you about your inspiration regarding cross-cultural psychology. Mm -hmm. What inspired you? Has there been a pivotal moment for you that mm -hmm. made you get interested in the topic? Well, the pivotal moment was being born. Um, I grew up in a society in Canada, a village in which uh, most people were French-speaking and my family was English-speaking. And of course the general context in Canada is that we have people living from all over the world. So it, uh, it was pretty natural that many of us, in fact at the conference, uh, are Canadians who are in the field of cross-cultural psychology because of these early and personal experiences. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in the 1960s, many of us uh, began to understand that uh, cultural factors were uh, essential components of understanding human behavior, and we formed the organization. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a founding member. Uh, there are two people here who are also uh, founding members. I've been to every conference, every mm -hmm. international conference. Uh, some of that will be discussed in the session this afternoon on the mm -hmm. early days. Yeah. So one of the one of the uh, issues that has preoccupied me um, is how how can people of different cultural backgrounds actually live together when they have been raised in different societies and have different values and beliefs and behaviors. And uh, <coughs> the most recent work is just finished in a book that uh, asks this question in 17 different countries. And uh, in those countries we uh, sample people who are members of the dominant larger society and members of various uh, cultural communities, non-dominant communities. Many of them are Rus Russian. Um, mm -hmm. My current job is in Moscow. Um, I think five of those 17 societies have Russian samples mm -hmm. and we're having a symposium on that uh, uh, this afternoon. So the question is, can we find some general principles that might allow us to pursue policies that more effectively allow mm -hmm. people to relate to each other in positive ways? And there are three principles that uh, we explore in the book. Uh, one is uh, what we call the multiculturalism principle, and that is when people feel secure and confident in their cultural place in the society, they will be able to accept those who are different. Mm -hmm. And that applies both to the dominant group if they feel conversely threatened by immigrants or refugees, or if immigrants or refugees are discriminated against and told that they're not wanted to at least not to be the way they are, then this will provide a basis for hostility. Whereas when there is acceptance and support uh, for the continuity of different cultures, then this provides a basis for mutual acceptance. Mm -hmm. The second principle is the integration principle, and that is uh, a lot of research shows, and we test this, that when people uh, feel that they can engage in and, and find support from both their heritage culture and the larger society, then they have higher levels of well-being, both personal and social uh, well-being, than if somehow they're forced to choose between being who you have been, stay that way, uh, or being forced to assimilate. In other mm -hmm. words, if you want to live here, become like us. If you are permitted and have the opportunities to be both, mm -hmm. then you have higher levels of well-being. Mm -hmm. And the third principle that we explore is the old one of contact, that opportunities for people to get together rather than producing barriers or walls. Uh, having bridges between cultures uh, uh, leads to greater mutual acceptance in the long run. And we found that approximately 80% of the tests of these mm -hmm. principles in this uh, most recent project, uh, we find support for them. And in the other 20%, there's either no support or, in a few cases, contrary. Mm -hmm. So we can summarize by saying that when <coughs> you know who you are and you have an accepted place in society, you're able to accept those who are different. Mm -hmm. Conversely, if you're threatened or undermined in some way, you will reject those who are the source of the threat. Secondly, when you can be uh, who you want to be uh, in multiple ways, when you can participate in all cultural groups in your society, you have greater levels of well-being and mutual respect. And third, when there are bridges being built rather than walls, you have greater opportunities to, mm -hmm. to develop uh, more positive relationships in societies. 
And of course, these three principles are opposite to what is happening in many countries right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we hope that uh, the evidence provided by this kind of research will, if not accepted by the leadership, uh, at least be accepted in general by the population who will then say, hey, you guys are doing it wrong. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And in turn, encourage the poli uh, poli uh, policy makers yeah. to... Or boot the, bu boot the bums out if they don't uh, listen. Mm -hmm. So I understand that currently you are based in Moscow. So I imagine that you have a, a better or a clearer perspective on what's going on in Europe and is, do you see any differences, like what kind of differences do you see between Eastern European countries and Western European countries in terms of cross-cultural cross psychology? Yeah. Well, it used to be that there were, I think, substantial differences, but in many respects, uh, Western Europe, whether it's Poland or Hungary or Britain or came close to it in France, are moving towards more more authoritarian, more rejecting, more dismissive, less respectful way of dealing with the issues that we try to understand in cross-cultural psychology. Uh, so in, in those respects, the world is moving in the wrong direction. That's in both um, Eastern and Western Europe. Uh, and in other respects, I would say Canada is the outlier right now. We're moving in quite an opposite direction. Um, we have for example, at an election last year, uh, no politician who had even begun to raise a question about the importance and legitimacy of immigration would have gotten elected. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just not on the political agenda. Um, we know that that's who we are, we know that's how we will have been and will move forward. Uh, but why the world has turned it the way it has mm -hmm. is, uh, is difficult to understand. Uh, you know, most, most Western countries, even including Australia, has reversed mm -hmm. course uh, and has become more restrictive, more, more harsh, more intolerant mm -hmm. in the last few years. So uh, maybe we can um, keep our vision alive mm -hmm. and then share, eventually some people might want to share it. Yes. Understand that yourself and your co-researchers, like your uh, main aim is for your research and for the findings of your research to be introduced to the wider public and for the public to embrace it first so that later on they can. Um, and currently, what do you think is the reception of the public uh, of cross-cultural psychology and of the findings that uh, researchers are presenting? Uh, mostly the public is unaware of, uh, of uh, what psychology actually is. Their mm -hmm. image of psychology is as a clinical practice to deal with people who are having personal problems. Psychology as a science of human behavior that can influence uh, knowledge about how to live together and influence politicians about how to create policies is relatively limited. Um, I think that uh, going public with what we know is important. I do that as often as I can. Mm -hmm. um, and I particularly try to uh, to deal with politicians or senior civil servants to share the knowledge uh, that we have. So in the last 20 years I've been working quite closely with the Estonian government. Mm -hmm. um, last week I met with the Estonian Minister of Culture who came to Canada, mm -hmm. uh, attempting to further convince them that uh, forcing the Russians to become Estonian in order to be accepted, Estonian in identity and language to become accepted in the society is not the way to go. Mm -hmm. You can't force people to be something they're not and don't want to be. Uh, so finding ways to mutually accept each other is, uh, is the message that I've been trying to convey mm -hmm. to politicians everywhere that I have a chance to meet with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about your grassroots work, like the public reception and bringing your research to the wider public? Have you, mm. what kind of attempts uh, are you making your co-researchers and what do you think could be made? Further. Often it's not uh, the wider public, but at the community level, the level of the communities in which we work to share our information. Uh, when I work with uh, indigenous peoples in various parts mm -hmm. of the world, um, and that's relatively easy to do because they are uh, <coughs> a, a circumscribed uh, community. They have uh, a life of their own and they, they have boundaries and you can go and share this information and try to deal with the findings that you you have and want to share and try to convince them that there's some validity to it. Um, public education uh, is more difficult because mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, of the um, the startle bias of the public media. They just want uh, startling headlines and short uh, short quips uh, <clears throat> and very often the message is more subtle and more complicated than they want to deal with. 
but the three principles that I shared with you uh, I can put in a couple of sentences each and um, uh, I think at that level of pr precision or or ease of communication they could well have some some degree of understanding and acceptance mm -hmm. and possibly change of uh, of how things are done mm -hmm. but the political agenda is driven by fear by money by greed by uh, sensationalism uh, need for power uh, and so evidence uh, has a limited ability to change all of that mm -hmm. okay thank you so much for your okay. time you're welcome it was lovely to have you